Hmm. I have to teach composition. Composition? Let's see. What are those rules for composition again? Um, what did I learn in college? What are those rules I learned in college for composition? Um, start on, starting in on tonic or dominant. Um, let's see. You have to understand all the passing tones, neighbor tones. You have to choose a key. You need to make sure that there's some repetition, but some definite changes in there as well. I just, I can't wrap my head around how to do this with young children. How do I teach composition? All of that seems like so higher level thinking that I just can't even wrap my head around that. I just, <laughs> uh, why are you trying to make it so hard? What was that? When you talk to kindergarten about quarter notes, are you telling them that it is just a quarter of a beat and that four of them go into a whole note? And are you talking to them about eighth notes being half of a beat no. and two of them go into a quarter note? Of course they don't no. teach that way. Because it's beyond where they are in their level of understanding. We can make composition easier. Okay. Move over. Let me show you how. So welcome to my channel where we talk about tips and tricks for teaching elementary music. I want to talk to you about a subject that I failed miserably at teaching for over 25 years. As a matter of fact, I didn't even really try it. And that is composition. As you saw in the beginning of my video, I was sitting there freaking out over um, looking at the Virginia SOLs, the state that I teach in, and the fact that they all have a composition SOL up there. It has been a subject that I have never really tried to figure out because I couldn't wrap my head around getting past all of those many rules that I learned in college when I had to do composition for a class and you knew you were going to be graded on the various elements and key changes and dissonance and consonants and um and whether or not you ended on a dominant or subdominant, and what was your chord progression, et cetera, et cetera. Really higher level college thinking and processing. And I teach kindergarten through fifth grade. I absolutely could not wrap my head around any way that I could teach composition to these students. That is until last year when we were in hybrid teaching. So at the beginning of the year last year, I was virtual from the beginning of the school year all the way till March. And then in March, we went back to a hybrid setting where I, when I was teaching, I was teaching concurrently with Zoomies and Roomies. So about 10 or less children in the room with me and then up to 10 or 20 on Zoom with me at the same time. And I had been thinking about a way to add a new little project that we could work on once we got things settled. So we went back in kind of in the middle of March and spring break was coming up in April. So I wanted to come up with something to do for that last 10 minutes or so of class or every class period once we got from back from spring break and then have a finished product to show at the end of the school year. And I landed on composition. I had to stop and think about how I was gonna do that. And I'm gonna show you the, the little tools that I used and how I ended up teaching it. And I have every intention of doing it again this spring and when I do it, I may keep it exactly the same in some instances, and I may add or take away things in other instances, because it definitely was a learning process for me last year. And we're just going to get started. So let me show you how I began. So there were a few phases that I had to go to, through in order to do this composition project. 
One of the phases is something that I do every year without thinking about composition at all, and that is to teach melody. So with kindergarten and first grade, melody teaching includes talking about steps, skips, leaps, and repeats. I use a step bell when I'm talking about all these things, which I'm gonna show you a picture of here. It really helps as a visual guide for the students so that when I'm doing something, say, C to E, they can see that as a skip. If I go C, C, they can see that that's a repeat, a leap if I go from C to G, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to melody instruction with kindergarten and first grade, it is all based on really intervals. We're talking steps, skips, leaps, and repeats. How does the melody move? When it comes to second through fifth grade, that's when I add the treble clef letters in. So I teach the treble clef and whichever way works for you is fine. I say elephants get big dirty feet. Whatever saying you wanna do works great. And then of course you've got your F-A-C-E and I use the hand staff to teach it so the students can hold it up and say it with me so they get used to that placement of all of those notes and also they can quiz each other they can face each other and say okay what is this and the other person should be able to say e and back and forth so when it came to composition the actual composition so they've already so k and one have done intervals really movement and second through fifth have talked about treble clef letters so now my next part of my composition prep had to be creating these Google Slides, which I'm gonna show you now. So I have a Google Slide presentation here, and this is how I started. What I did first was I opened up a new slide presentation. Then I went ahead and got rid of these uh, lovely slides that I didn't want. So I typed in today, free transparent staff. I honestly don't remember what I typed in when I was looking for this, but we're gonna go with this. And we're gonna pull this over. And I'm gonna bring it down, cause I don't want it to be as big as that. Center it better. And I'm going to get this treble clef, put it on here. Bring it down as well. And then I'm gonna add some lines to make my measures. And I'm gonna make that a weighted line of about here. And I'm gonna copy it. And I'm gonna paste it over here. All right. So maybe it's something you wanna draw yourself, uh, maybe you wanna create it in another way, but you just get a basic treble staff up there. So you're gonna click on the slide once you have it the way you want it, and you're gonna go up to File, and click on Download, and um, let's make it a JPEG. It doesn't matter whether it's a JPEG or the other one, the PNG, a ping, however you want to say that, um, just as long as it's a picture. Because on this next slide, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of those. And we are going to um, change the background. So we're going to say change background. We're going to choose the image. And it is, there it is, done. So up here, this was the first one. You can still move things around, right? And things can get out of proportion. But now this is the background. So this is, this is not movable anymore. Nothing is movable in here. It stays in the background. Okay, I can't even resize it, nothing, okay? So that was the idea of what I did to start. And then I went to found images that were quarter notes 
and just kind of threw them up here. Half notes, some eighth notes that I actually had to create these. This isn't really legit eighth note. It is, as you can see, two quarter notes that I just made a beam and did that. Okay. And so on and so forth. I just put a bunch of different rhythms together and then I duplicated um, the slide several times. Let's see, there's one, two, three, four, and then I switched over and so on and so forth. So that was what I started out with is I started out with this, just a basic, here we go, composition pay, um, slide presentation. And I made one for each class. So for example, um, I went up here to file and I said, make a copy of entire presentation. And I named it, uh, let's say, uh, I'm just gonna make up a name on the spot, um, Smith, right? And okay. So each class had its own presentation ready to go so when we started, they all looked the same because nobody did anything, right? Okay, so, so now we're in the actual process of doing this project, of making this composition. So I was now time for my first student, and we're going to talk about kindergarten and first grade. I asked them what they wanted first, step, skip, leap, or repeat. So let's say they wanted a step. So knowing that I want to keep in C major, that's where my head is while I'm starting this, that I want to keep in C major. So I'm thinking C chord, F chord, G chord. That's kind of where I'm going in my brain. So I started on G, let's say. Plus, I don't know if this is going to end up being the first measure of the song. I'll explain more what I mean about that when we get into another phase of this process. And they said they wanted a step. And then I want to skip. And then let's say they wanted a leap. I don't know. And in this, they might have said, um, I want a leap. But after I played it for them on that bell set, oh, no, I'd rather have a repeat. So I just turned that around and put it a repeat there. Now, I did have some leeway later on when I was putting these compositions together to manipulate this to a point. As long as I stayed with the thought process of the child, the child told me they wanted a step, a skip, and a repeat, I could easily go, okay, let's start on A for this one. Let's go to G, and let's bring this down to E and E, right? because I'm still following that concept of step, skip, and repeat. So that was fine, and that made it easier to make kindergarten and first grade a little bit more melodic at times. Then after I would do that, I would put the child's name down, and that way the next time I came in here, I knew whose that was, and I knew that I didn't miss that child from doing their measure. So this became a measure, and then the next time, or the next student on the list, so that I would take like about a good 10 minutes at the end of class to do this. So I might get, depending on the day, three, four, five kids. It just depended on how long it took them to decide what they wanted to do. Once I played it for them, if they wanted to make any changes, if there was something going on that day um, that caused us to not be able to finish that full 10 minutes, like say somebody needing to stop and go to the bathroom so there's a, or a classroom interruption for a different reason. So it just, it just depended on the day. But I tried to get through at least about four or five kids in a given day. So now we're going to look at how I did second through fifth grade. So they were using the treble clef letters. So they would tell me I want E. And I would say low E or high E. Oh, I want high E. Okay. Uh, D, low or high, low. And I did have some kids that thought that this would be just really cool to have these beyond octaves um, 
because they might even be F to low D, G to low D. They, they thought that that was going to be like the coolest sound in the world. And then when I played it for them, they weren't always that impressed. Um, and then I want low F and I want low G. And sometimes right on the spot, when I would play this, they go immediately, ah, I'm not crazy about that. Can you bring that down to low E? Or can you bring everything else up if that was their preference? So I just, you know, this was the student's composition. It was their choice. On occasion, I might ask them if they wanted a suggestion from me. Like if they said, you know what? I don't really like how that sounds, but I don't know how to fix it. I might say, do you want some suggestions, right? And in the, in that case, I might have said, why, why don't you see what it sounds like with the E down here? Okay. Or why don't you see what it sounds like if we move this note over here or whatever, whatever the scenario was. And sometimes they would take my suggestions and sometimes they wouldn't. But I was not trying to change their, uh, their composition process. I was trying to let them be as true to what they were thinking as possible and only jumping. And I was trying to be more of a facilitator, really, than the lead composer. I was really trying to let them do the work. So once everybody got a chance to choose what they wanted in their measure, we went over to make sure that they got any changes that they wanted. Now it was time to pick percussion instruments that were gonna go underneath of the melody. I decided I wasn't gonna to try to make any harmony parts or chord progressions or anything underneath of the melody. I just wanted to have percussion accompaniment. And that was for a couple different reasons. Uh, the first one is this is the very first time I was making this composition project. And so I was trying to do it the most simple way that I could figure out how to do it. And another reason was I really wanted the melody to shine. And I knew that I didn't have enough time or hadn't decided how to get my students to compose harmony or chord progressions along with their melody. So therefore, if I was going to put a lot of harmony or chord progressions in me, that would almost make me the influencer, the lead composer of the song, which I was really trying to be a facilitator of instead. So what I did was I did choose four percussion instruments and I did choose a specific rhythm that they were going to play. So the students get, didn't get to say, okay, I want the drums, but I want the drums to play you know, they didn't get to make that choice on what the drums were going to play because that was going to be too difficult for me doing this with 25 classes, constantly making up different percussion patterns underneath of the melody. So I decided to streamline this process and just choose four basic, very basic rhythm patterns for these four instruments. So I'm gonna play the four patterns that I chose for you. Each one I just recorded very simply. Rhythm sticks. Sticks, two, three, go. So clear quarter notes, straight quarter notes. Maracas. Maracas, two, three, go. And they were the straight eighth notes. Tambourine three, go. You can clearly hear half notes. Drum two, three, go. And just a simple ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. So I played all four for the students and we went back to their um, composition and I would say, okay, which one do you want? So let's say that this student said that they wanted drums and maracas. Okay, so I would just type it in there just so that I knew when I came there that that's what goes with that measure. And then 
I found something that just took this project to a whole new level. And I'm gonna show you that next. Once I had all of their information, I printed out that Google slide presentation and I took it to the piano and I played through each one of those individual measures to listen, okay, does slide one sound better as slide five and slide five sounds better as slide two. And I tried to make them go together better like a jigsaw puzzle idea to see where, where the melodic pattern sounded the best. In the case of KN1, if I needed to manipulate a little bit, like I told you earlier, with going from a G to an F, and it sounded better in that particular measure to go B to A instead, but still maintaining that stepwise motion that the student wanted, then I would do that. In the case of second through fifth grade, if they had some really big jumps that were like ninths or tenths kind of jumps, you know, beyond octaves, and it just really wasn't working out, then I just simply brought them down or up an octave if I had to do that to make it fit in with the rest of the song. But other than that, I wasn't moving. If the child wanted a D, I wasn't moving it to an E or a G or something different like that. I was just trying to change octaves where needed and um, change where on the staff to move those intervals, but maintaining those stepwise uh, leaps, repeats, skips that the KM1 wanted in that case. In some cases, I discovered that the majority of the song sounded better if I would add a different key outside of C. So I had some classes who ended up having their composition in G or even D, and I had one class whose composition sounded best in A minor. It is just the way that their intervals worked out, the way their placement on the staff worked out, that it just sounded better in that respect. And so all I did was in those cases was add a sharp here and there in order to make it sound more melodic. And I checked with the students beforehand to make sure that that would be okay. And they said that that would be so now I want to show you this wonderful software program that I found that is free. It's called Muse Score 3. And it when you open it up, this is what it looks like. And you you can see you've got all your notes up here, um, sharps and flats. So for example, I could go. I'm just making it up. I'm not even really looking at where I'm placing it. But when it came to the students, I actually looked at their notation and dragged and dropped whatever I needed where I needed it. So I'm going to show you a couple of different um, compositions that we did. So the first one I'm going to show you is this was one of my first grade classes. So we were working on just those intervals, those steps, skips, leaps, repeats. And you can just see the melody here. This is without the percussion parts added in. So this was my first step was to make the melody. And then I went from there to add in those percussion parts. Eventually, once I got a little bit further into this project, I realized it was easier to do it all at once. But in the beginning, I was still figuring out the software and didn't know exactly how I wanted to do those percussion parts. But let me play this for you here so you can hear what it sounds like. Okay, so that's um, theirs. So now you can see I've gone and put in the percussion parts that they wanted. And you can clearly see like this person, this child did not want any percussion on their measure. This child only wanted the drums and so on and so forth. 
This part right here is my composition part. I did do this with each one of my classes that I added a little something on the end, like a little coda, if you will, just to kind of wrap up the piece and make it feel finished. So here's the full composition. Okay, so that was, like I said, a first grade class. So a lot of the actual pitch placement, I got to manipulate a little bit as long as I followed their interval choices. Now I'm gonna show you what ended up being my favorite piece. And this was a fourth grade class. And this was the one that turned out to sound best when it was in A minor. So I didn't do anything to this except add the sharp in order to make it sound like it was in a minor. I also added this ending piece here in order to finish up the song. I believe, I know the chords were mine. I believe this was mine and I think this might have been mine as well, but maybe not. So you can also see how sparse these students were with their percussion accompaniment they really wanted their melody to shine. Oh, this was mine as well right here. Here we go. Oh, let me make this bigger. I should have made the other one bigger. View. That's better. So that was a really fun one um, that I really enjoyed and I liked adding the little coda part in there and the students really liked that one. And then the final thing that I did once I made these was I put them onto YouTube and sent them out to the parents so they can see what we did in our class. And uh, I didn't really hear much back from the parents, but last year was a year that parents were extremely overwhelmed and I understand that. But I know that my students really enjoyed doing this project. And the teachers at my school that got to see the finished product enjoyed it as well. So bottom line, you can teach composition to students as young as kindergarten. As long as you meet them where they are, if you've given them melodic instructions such as steps, skips, leaps, and repeats, and you let them work on their own measure like I showed you in my Google slide presentation, and help them with just placing the notes using the intervals that they tell you, steps, skips, leaps, and repeats, and then you take the finished product of all the students and put them together, put a little bit of percussion accompaniment in the background, so nothing fancy like harmony or chord progressions going along. You can come up with a basic composition that the students can be really proud of. It takes the, the fear of composing away from the teacher and it demystifies it for the students. So that in the future, if you ask them to do a little bit more in the realm of composition, they might be like, oh yeah, I remember doing something in kindergarten. I got this. All right. Those are all the tips and tricks that I have for teaching composition. I hope that you found something interesting in this video, and I hope that you will 
not forget to subscribe. Have a fantastic day.